What's up everyone? Welcome to my channel, Cyber Hashira. First of all, I am truly sorry that it took so long to upload this video. I needed some time to do some research and plan how to make this video. So today, I'm going to talk about digital certificates. I have seen many folks getting confused about how to properly generate and use digital certificates. In my upcoming videos, I will be using digital certificates frequently. I will be performing tasks such as generating self-signed certificates, generating uh, CSR, signing CSR, revoking a certificates, and um, setting various extensions to those certificates and things like that. At any point, I don't want you to be confused about what I'm doing. I'm just making sure that you're familiar with some basic terms used with digital certificates. This is going to be a detailed video on certificates where I will try to explain almost everything about it. All right, enough of that intro, let's begin. So what is a digital certificate? Well, you see that image on the right? That's what a digital certificate looks like. A digital certificate is simply a digital document used to trust someone or something on a network or internet. It is also known as a public key certificate. They follow X.509 specification as described in RFC 5280. A certificate contains information which is always digitally signed. Therefore the name digital certificate. They may include information such as public key associated with a private key of a certificate owner, information such as organization name, location, email address, and the department. A certificate will have a date and time of issuance, including an expiration date. A certificate will also have information about their intended purpose. These certificates are distributed on the internet or within a network freely. Uh, certificates helps in proving the identity of its owner or to prove their authenticity. For this reason, certificates are mostly used by a web server for HTTPS. You must have heard of SSL TLS. If you are using a computer or any electronic device, then the chances are there is a certificate in use somewhere. Most of your web browsing is secured by HTTPS. You may be using a smart card or a USB token which has a certificate stored in it so you could authenticate on a corporate computer. I mentioned the word X.509 in my previous slide. Now X.509 or I call it X509 is a standard by ITU, International Telecommunication Union which defines the format of a certificate. X509 was first introduced in 1988 as X509 version 1. Uh, this version was later revised as version 2 and then version 3. Version 3 certificates are most common these days. RFC 5280 specification of X509 certificates also describes CRL and certification path. I'll explain what they are later in this video. Now let's talk about the version of X509 certificates. There are three versions, version 1, version 2 and version 3. Version 1 was introduced in 1988. They only had some basic information such as uh, serial numbers, subject names, subject, uh, sorry, signature algorithm, uh, issuer name, validity and the public key. Version 1 certificates was found to be lacking some features because of which it was revised as version 2. Version 2 certificates included a unique identifier for the issuer and the subject along with the properties of version 1. It was again revised as version 3 because of some uh, uh, features it lacked and version 3 certificates started using extensions along with the properties from version 1 and version 2. If I ever need SSL certificates for my website, I would have to apply for that. 
My initial step would be to generate a key pair using an asymmetric algorithm such as RSA or ECDSA. Once my key pair is generated, I need to apply for a certificate. To get a signed certificate from a CA, I would have to request for it. And uh, to do this, I would have to generate a CSR. A CSR is also known as Certificate Signing Request. Imagine CSR to be just like an application form to get a signed certificate. It is a, a document just like a digital certificate. Uh, it would contain my public key along with some distinguished information about me. This information is signed using my private key and that signature is added to the CSR. Once my CA receives my CSR, it would review it. So uh, in the review process, it would verify my signature using the public key that I included in the CSR. If my CA can verify my signature, it would proceed with other verification process which it needs to perform as per their policy. And then they would finally issue a signed certificate. I mentioned CRL in one of my previous slide. CRL is Certificate Revocation List. A CRL is simply a list of all revoke certificate, a bunch of certificate that has been revoked by a CA. Every certificate has a validity period. However, if CA needs to revoke a certificate, it will add the serial number of that certificate into a list called CRL. The reason why a CA might decide to revoke a certificate could be because the private key has been compromised or it could be because uh, a certificate was found to be invalid or not in use anymore. For example, when an employee leaves an organization, the CA for that organization would revoke all certificate used by that employee after they leave. Other scenario could be like an employee lost their smart card, so CA of that company will revoke that employee's certificate as a precautionary measure. A CRL is always timestamped and signed by CA. They are distributed to a remote entity using CRL distribution point or in short CDP. I will explain what they are in this video so stay with me. The next term that I want to talk about is called timestamping. Timestamping is a crucial part of PKI. It is used for proving the existence of a data at certain point in time. For example, I'm sure you must have signed a physical document or seen a document signed with a date and maybe a time. This way, it's easy for anyone to prove that a document was signed on a certain date. The receiver of that document can't refute that the document was signed in some other date. Digital timestamping is exactly that. If you are a developer, you might want to sign and timestamp your software so you could prove that your software was signed on a certain date and time. To digitally timestamp a document, your document signing program calculates a hash of that document and then sends it over to the TSA or Timestamping Authority. This process is known as Timestamping Request. The TSA would then add a timestamp with the current date and precise time to that hash. They would rehash that data and then sign it with their own private key. This signed data is then sent back to the requester who then adds that timestamp to their document. The response that you will see from TSA is called timestamping response. I will be uploading a video on code signing where I will show you how timestamping works. For now, I just need you to know what timestamping is. Now I'm going to dissect a digital certificate and explain all contents we see in it. For this exercise, I have already downloaded a global sign certificate. The three screenshots that you see are from my Windows machine. When you open a certificate file on Windows, you should see three tabs, General, Details and Certification Path. We'll start with the General tab. The first thing you would see when you open a certificate file in Windows is the General tab. And the first thing you see in the General tab is the purpose of the certificate. I have highlighted that portion with a red outline. 
You can clearly see that the purpose of the certificate is to prove identity of a client and the server. We also see to whom the certificate was issued to and who was the issuer. It also includes the start date and the end date, or you can just call it validity period of the certificate. When a certificate expires, it will be considered untrusted. For example, I'm sure you know what a passport is. A passport has an expiration date. It's uh, valid for like 10 years for an adult and I guess it's uh, for f uh, 5 years if you are a minor. You will not be allowed to travel using an expired certificate. Similarly, if your document signing certificate expires, then your signed document will not be trusted by an operating system. In most cases, a document signing software would simply reject it. You will then have to contact your certificate authority to get your certificate renewed. I downloaded this global sign certificate on my computer as a P7B file. Microsoft operating system gives me the option to install the certificate into my certificate store if required. I also see a issuer statement. Clicking on issuer statement would open your web browser and uh, display the certification practice statement of the issuing CA. I will explain what a CPS is later on in this video. Let's move on to details tab. Image on the right shows what details tab looks like. In this tab, we see a drop down list at the top uh, with a label show. The image on the left has all available options in the show drop down list. Version 1 fields only option shows only version 1 information from a certificate. This information includes uh, uh, information such as version, serial number, signature algorithm, signature hash algorithm, issuer, valid to, valid from, subject, public key and public key parameters. Extensions only would display all extensions which includes key usage, extended key usage, authority information access, certificate policy, CRL distribution point, subject alternate names, authority key identifier, subject key identifier, and SCT list. Then we have uh, critical extension. Critical extensions only uh, displays uh, extensions that are marked as critical. Properties would show the thumbprint. And please don't worry, I will explain each of these later in this video. Certification path tab shows the certificate chain. In this image, www.globalsign.com is the subject for whom the certificate was issued to. It was issued by an intermediate CA with the subject name Global Sign Extended Validation CA SHA-256 G3. And at the top, we see the Global Sign Root Certificate, which has Global Sign Root CA R3 as a subject name. You would also see certificate status down below. In this screenshot, you are seeing certificate status as OK, indicating that everything is good with this certificate. If there is a problem, you would see a message describing the problem that was found. For example, um, you might see an error message that says, this certificate was revoked by its CA. Or you might see a message that says, issuer certificate was not found or you could also see a message that says certificate is not trusted. Let's go back to our details tab. Um, it has like so many options, so let's discuss each of them. Versions is the first option that you see in the details tab. Versions shows the version of X509 certificate which is being used. In this screenshot, we see version three as the value in the versions field. Next field after version is a serial number, which shows a serial number of a certificate. It is a unique positive long integer value assigned by a CA to each certificate. Now some CA may use a counter to generate uh, these serial numbers, but that's considered unsafe these days. So most CAs may use the current uh, time. So they would calculate the epoch time and they would use that as a serial number of a certificate. In some cases, CA may decide to generate a small hash value to be used as a serial number. Uh, the value that you see in this screenshot, it's a hash value. 
Next we have a signature algorithm, which is the algorithm that was used to sign a certificate. In this screenshot, we see SHA-256 with RSA as the algorithm which was used for signing. This means a SHA-256 hash of this certificate was signed using RSA private key. Signature hash algorithm is the hashing algorithm which was used for generating a hash of the certificate. Issuer is the name of the CA that signed a certificate request and issued the signed certificate. In this screenshot, we see global sign extended validation CA-SHA-256-G3 as the common name for the issuing CA who issued the certificate. Valid from shows the starting date of a certificate. Certificates have a validity date and start date shows the date a certificate will be valid from. Valid to is simply the date when a certificate would expire. Subject field shows distinguished information about a subject certificate was issued to. Information contained in this field are common name, organization, organizational unit, country, location, state, email address, and few more. Public key shows the ASN1 encoded public key data stored in the certificate in hex format. Public key parameter shows the parameters to be used to verify a certificate. There are some signing algorithms that requires a parameter. For example, RSA PSS requires some parameter to sign and verify. You should see those parameters if such algorithms were used. In this image, we see 0500, which means null. In case of ECDSA key, you should see the curve in use. Authority information access gives information on how to get the issuer certificate. It should have a link uh, from where the issuer certificate can be downloaded. It also has a link to OCSP from where the status of certificate can be verified. Like in this image, you can clearly see there's a URL, uh, http colon slash slash secure.globalsign.com slash cert, and then we have the issuing CA certificate. So if you want, you could use that link to directly download that certificate. And down below, we have the link for uh, OCSP. So http colon slash slash ocsp2.globalsign.com will be used to verify the status of this certificate. And the next field we have is certificate policy. A certificate policy is simply a statement given by a certificate authority. It describes all security measures that must be followed by a subject before a certificate can be issued to them. This statement by a CA clearly states how a subject would be verified what they are allowed to do with those certificates and under what circumstance a CA may decide to revoke their certificate. It also includes various security policies that a subject should implement. Along with certificate policy, a CA also includes something called CPS, Certification Practice Statement. A certificate policy discloses what a subject should do and a CPS discloses how they should do it. Basic constraints is a property used to indicate whether a certificate belongs to a CA or some non-CA entity. This extension has two attributes. The first attribute is subject type. If you see subject type as CA, then it means it is a CA certificate. Any other value apart from CA would mean it's a non-CA certificate. Now the screenshot that you see on the right shows a user certificate. You can clearly see that it has a it has a value of end entity, which means it is a non-CA certificate. Uh, the screenshot that you see on the left shows basic constraint, and the basic constraint has subject type as CA, and that means that certificate is a CA certificate. The second attribute that we have for basic constraint is called path length. Now, this property defines how many sub-CAs can exist under a CA. That is, if the, that certificate you're looking at is a CA certificate. The screenshot that you see on the left shows path length as zero, which means no sub-CA can exist under this CA. 
For example, if there's a CA called CA1 with a path length of 2, then that would mean CA1 will allow a maximum of 2 sub-CAs in the chain. So CA1 can have CA2 under it and CA2 can have CA3 under it. If the path length is none and the subject type is CA, then that would mean that CA can have as many sub-CAs as required. A CRL distribution point or CDP is the path from where a remote client can download a CRL. There's usually a URL mentioned in CDP which points directly to a CRL file. This CRL file can be used by the client to check the status of a certificate. If you look at the screenshot, you can clearly see there's a URL that says http colon slash slash crl dot global sign dot com slash gs and then we have the CRL file. So this CRL can be used to check the status of a certificate. Subject alternate names or SAN has all alternate subject names for a certificate. Alternate names can be a domain name, IP address or a wildcard. For example, just imagine that I have a site called uh, cyberhashira.com, which can be accessed over HTTPS. A web browser would expect the common name of my SSL certificate to be cyberhashira.com. That is, the common name should match with the domain name. If it does not match, then the, uh, there would be an untrusted connection. Now imagine that there are some subdomains such as uh, videos.cyberhashira.com or blog.cyberhashira.com. Instead of creating multiple SSL certificates for those domains, I can simply include those domains as a subject alternate name. I can even mention the public IP address of cyberhashira.com in SAN. If I don't mention those domain in SAN, then accessing any of those subdomains would result in an untrusted connection. Uh, let's have a look at the screenshot. Uh, you can see that SAN has several subdomains uh, for global sign. Uh, here, instead of using separate certificates for all those subdomains, global sign decided to include all those domains in SAN. So now if you try to access any of those domain, your browser will be able to establish a trusted HTTPS connection. Key usage is used to define what a certificate is allowed to do. Think of it this way. Imagine you have a certificate with RSA public key. Now you could use that public key to encrypt data or encrypt a key. You could also use uh, uh, that public key to verify a signature of a data or a CRL. Now, what if you want a public key to be restricted to just verifying signature of a data? After all, these, uh, these certificates are distributed publicly, right? So depending on who these certificates are issued to, I want to restrict what they can do with it. I can do this using key usage extension. Key usage allows a key to be restricted to some specific type of operation. These operations are indicated using usage bits. There are a total of 9 usage bits starting from usage bit 0 which is digital signature and all the way till usage bit 8 which is decipher only. The first usage bit that we have is usage bit 0 which is digital signature. Using this usage bit I can restrict a public key to only verify assigned data and nothing else. The next usage bit that we have is usage bit 1 which is for non-repudiation. I can use it to prevent a signing entity from falsely denying some action. Usage bit 2 is for key encipherment which will allow a public key to encrypt another key for key transportation purpose. For example, if you have an AS key and if you want to share that AS key with your colleague, you could uh, simply encrypt it using the, uh, the public key that they provided and uh, share the encrypted data and they should be able to decrypt it using their own private key. Then we have usage bit 3 which is data encipherment. This allows a public key to encrypt some data. Next we have usage bit 4 which is for key agreement. Now this allows a public key to be used for key agreement purpose. That is if you're using a supported algorithm such as uh, Diffie-Hellman for example. 
Usage bit 5 is key search sign. This allows a public key to verify signature of a certificate. Usage bit 6 is CRL sign. This allows a public key to verify signature of a CRL. Then we have usage bit 7, which is N cipher only. Now this bit only works when key agreement bit is also set. This allows a shared secret key derived using key exchange to be only allowed for encryption purpose. Usage bit 8 is decipher only, which is the opposite of N cipher only. This usage bit will also work if key agreement bit is set and it will only allow a shared secret key which was derived during key exchange to only decrypt data. Now depending on what you want to do, you could set multiple key usage set. For example, a digital signature usage bit can be set along with CRL sign and key cert sign. Now this allows a public key to verify signature of a data. It will also allow verifying signature of a CRL and verifying signature of a certificate. Next, we have enhanced key usage, which is also known as extended key usage or EKU in short. Now, EKU can be used to specify for what purpose a certificate is actually meant for. Extended key usage may seem like key usage properties. The key difference is that EKU is very specific. EQ specifies the purpose of certificate, whereas key usage specifies what a certificate can do. For example, a certificate with digital signature set for key usage can be used for verifying signature of a data. Now, if I add code signing as an extended key usage, then I'm restricting that public key of a certificate to only verify signature of a code or an application. Now the key usage specified in RFC 5280 are as follows. Uh, the first one is server authentication, which is used for server authentication. Then we have client authentication, which is meant for client authentication. Then we have code signing, which is used for signing binaries such as executable files or jar files or DLL files or maybe RPM files. Email protection is used for protecting your email, like signing email or encrypting your email. Then we have timestamping, which is used for timestamping purpose. OCSP signing is used for signing an OCSP response. Then we have any extended key usage, which will allow any kind of usage. It is totally unrestricted. A subject key identifier is used for identifying a certificate that contains a particular public key. This identifier is simply a SHA-1 hash of a public key. Subject key identifier is necessary for constructing a certificate path. Let me explain how certificate path is constructed in my next slide. We talked about subject key identifier, which is a SHA-1 hash of a public key. The main use of subject key identifier is to identify a certificate that contains a particular public key. In my previous slide, I also mentioned that subject key identifier is used for building a certificate chain. Let me explain how. Authority key identifier is a subject key identifier of a CA that issued a certificate. When a certificate request is signed by CA, the subject key identifier of that CA is embedded in the signed certificate as authority key identifier. This makes it easier to identify who signed a certificate. Now, every operating system has a trust store, which contains a bunch of uh, CA certificates. When a signed certificate is used, the authority key identifier embedded in it is used to identify the CA that signed that certificate. Now this process uh, is repeated multiple times till a root CA certificate is found. This is how an operating system builds a certificate chain. SCT is a short form for signed certificate timestamp. Now before I explain what SCT is, I think I should talk about CT log, which is also known as certificate transparency log. 
A certificate transparency is a new protocol which is used for publicly logging all certificates signed by CA. This log is publicly accessible and makes it easy for anyone to audit their CA. The idea is to eventually enforce it on all clients. I believe Google Chrome browser already has this enforced. A client can simply refuse to accept a certificate that does not appear in the CT log. Now this will eventually force all certificate authorities to publish their signed certificates into CT log. CT logs are append only, which means a certificate authority is only allowed to add entries to it. They can't make changes to it or remove an entry. The purpose of CT log is to avoid misuse of a certificate. So if anyone finds out about a certificate which is being misused, they can act on it as they see fit. When a new log is appended to CT log, a signed certificate timestamp is returned and SCT is the proof that a certificate is signed by a CA and has been added to a CT log. That's all I have for you in this video. I know I covered a lot about certificate in this video. Most of the videos that I will be uploading soon will have a certificate being used. Now that I have explained a digital certificate in detail, I'm sure you will have no confusion whatsoever in my upcoming videos. I have also pasted links in the description below to all relevant RFCs. And as always, please use the comment section if you have a question. I hope you learned something new from this video. If you did, then please leave a like. If you are new here, be sure to check out my other videos and please subscribe to my channel if you are not already subscribed. And thanks for watching. I'll hopefully see you soon in my next video. Bye bye.